you, Mauritian. Thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Welcome. It's a pleasure to um, get us started. So I will talking. I will be talking today about um, a couple of things. I will be talking about neuropsychiatry and what that is. I will be talking about neuromodulation. It's a new area of treatments that use devices. They don't use medications or psychotherapy, but machines, machines that can change brain activity. And by doing so, they can treat brain-based disorders. And then I'll talk about how we can do that to improve cognitive disorders, and specifically ADHD as a paradigm of cognitive disorders that affects children and adults, um, and for which we have some medications and some behavioral therapies, but they're only partially effective. So neuropsychiatry, not always, not everyone knows what neuropsychiatry is, so I'd like to start by just framing it. So, you know, often I get asked, but what's the real difference between neurology and psychiatry? And it's difficult sometimes to pinpoint it in a definition that is explicit, that is clear, that separates the two. And the reason is because that separation is artificial, right? So at the beginning of the 20th century, we didn't have neurology and psychiatry. We had neuropsychiatry. People like Alzheimer's or, or Kreplin, these physicians, they were pathologists and neurologists and psychiatrists. But through the course of the 20th century, the two specialties separated. And now we're seeing a trend to come back, to get them back together. And what's driving that coming back together is actually neuropsychiatry. And it's not just science, it's also patient care. It's an approach, it's a brain-based focus approach to taking care of patients, to thinking about the diagnosis, to thinking about treatments. So certainly, Understanding the brain is very clinically important for neuropsychiatry and for psychiatry in general. But it's not just theoretically important, it's important from the standpoint of treatments. We have three main types of treatments in psychiatry and in neurology. We have medications. The medications affect the brain at the level of molecules, at the level of neurotransmitters. We have psychotherapy. Psychotherapy affects the brain at the level of behavior, cognition, emotion. And then we have brain stimulation what I will be talking about today, that affects the brain at the level of brain circuits. It meets the brain where it's at. The brain uses electricity to communicate, electricity to create emotions, to create attention, to create behaviors. And we're trying to change that very electricity in a way that can be non-invasive, not painful, and very safe. So there's a whole set of technologies and treatments that we call brain stimulation. And we tend to classify them in these three groups that you see here. Some are surgical. That means it's like a pacemaker. It's implanted in the chest. It's a battery. It's a computer. Only that the leads don't go to the heart. They go to the brain. And that's used to treat conditions like Parkinson's disease or dystonia, also OCD. Of course, it's very invasive, so that's not for L patients. We have another group of therapies that are not surgical, they don't need a scalpel, but they still do need general anesthesia. These are the convulsive therapies. These are things like ECD, which is still the gold standard to treat conditions like depression. So we have the surgical ones, the convulsive ones, and now we have the non-invasive ones. These are techniques that also use devices, but we don't need a surgery, we don't need general anesthesia. It can be done in an ambulatory setting, meaning patients come to the clinics, they can drive themselves in, they get the treatment, and then go back home. Um, and it can even be done at home, like I'll discuss today. So it's a it's a bit of a revolution, a paradigm shift in how we are thinking about therapies, particularly we, we can bring these devices that are high-tech innovations to be treatments that patients do at home. So this opens an opportunity really to treat cognitive disorders. Cognitive disorders in general are very, very prevalent across neurological and psychiatric conditions. We see problems with cognitions in depression, in bipolar disorder, in schizophrenia, in addictions, in traumatic brain injury, in personality uh, disorders, in stroke, in Parkinson's disease, of course, in Alzheimer's and dementias. Um, and we're not very good at treating cognitive deficits. Why are we not very good at treating cognitive deficits? Because the systems in the brain that process cognitions, memory, attention, language, they're not very specific from a neurochemical perspective. That means there isn't something specific about those brain regions chemically that allows us to use chemicals like drugs, like pharmaceuticals, medications, to engage them, to change them, to get them better. That said, 
those systems are very, very specific from an anatomical perspective. We know the brain regions that are engaged in processing attention or memory. They're, chemically, they're not very different from the others, but anatomically, they're very different from the others. So we can leverage that anatomical specificity. We have a challenge, we have a window to get those areas to work better, to work well, and therefore to treat cognitive deficits. And that's precisely what we can do with brain stimulation. We can leverage that anatomical precision, change the patterns of brain activity, and get them to work better, to be more adaptive. So poor chemical specificity, great anatomical specificity. So let me get you started with a, a case to just make things more specific and more real. Uh, this is one of my patients. It's Paul C. Call him like this. He's a 24-year-old recent graduate um, of college, college graduate. He has a diagnostic of ADHD since childhood. So as a child, he was having some trouble in school. He was having trouble paying attention. He was a very edgy and fidgety kid. Um, it wasn't clear if he didn't want to deploy effort. He was interested in other things. Um, if he was behaviorally problematic until we figure out that he had ADHD. And we started with first with behavioral therapies, then some medication therapies. And he got well to a certain extent. Uh, attention got better. Some of the hyperactivity got better, but executive function did not get better. His capacity to plan activities, to multitask efficiently, to get started with a project when it's taking some effort, to wrap up the last details of a project, that did not get better. And we know that these medications improve attention and hyperactivity, but these executive functions, which are critical to function well, they don't touch them. Again, because they're not chemically specific, but they're anatomically specific. In addition, these medications work for some symptoms, but they also cause some trouble. He was not eating so well, he lost weight, um, and uh, he wasn't sleeping so well. So we had to start thinking about alternatives. So this is a problem, it's a challenge. It's also an opportunity to think about novel strategies to treat patients like Paul. So can we offer a treatment that improve executive function in a way that medications do not. Can we do that in a way that it's not causing side effects? So this has to be treatment that is not systemic. When we take a medication, we take it orally, it goes to our stomach, it goes to our gut, it goes to the blood, then goes to the liver, to the lungs, to the heart, to your fat tissue, to your muscle, and to the brain, but it goes everywhere in the brain. Can we have a treatment that goes only to the brain, and in fact, only to the parts of the brain that we actually want to stimulate? And more than that, can we do that at home so that patients don't have to come every day to the clinic so that they can continue with their lives and use the benefits of these therapies to just be more adaptive, to work, to go to school, to socialize, to be with the families, etc. So introducing this, yes, we can start doing that. So I'm going to talk about this one specific um, space of brain stimulation, it's transcranial electric stimulation. So what you can see here on the left side is a cartoon, but actually I have some of this devices that I brought with me, so I'll do a little demo. So as you can see here, um, there's two electrodes. There's a positive and a negative. So it's like anode and a cathode. And we put this on the surface of the head. Something like this. There's a strap. And this yellow and blue electrodes are carbon electrodes they're not metallic they don't hurt and they have a sponge around them that is soaked in saline basically water and salt that allows the conduction of electricity so this is placed like this on the head i have one on the left frontal cortex and one on the right frontal polar cortex i have this on the back I would connect this here, I would turn it on, and treatment starts. And I can do this for 20 minutes or 30 minutes a day. I can do it in the morning, I can do it in the afternoon, I can do it while I'm reading the news, I can do it while I'm watching TV. It's very safe, it doesn't hurt. Sometimes we feel a little tingling sensation, um, but it's, it's not painful. Just so you know that some of the current is going through the saline. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm actually using this positive electrode to increase the excitability, to increase the electrical activity of the left prefrontal cortex, which is that anatomical selectivity. I'm not affecting 
my liver, I'm not affecting my muscles, I'm not affecting the back of the brain or the side of the brain, I'm just affecting the part of the brain that I need to affect. There's other systems, there's other ways of doing this. So there's also this cap form, which you just put like this, you put like that, you have the two electrodes, you turn it on and treatment gets started. So we can use current in different ways. We can have direct current. We can have more um, um, complex form of currents, like oscillating current, like the one that comes out of the circuit. And we can put in different ways and we can even individualize it so that we can, at the individual patient's level, make sure that we're increasing the power of the brain that not is just important for the disease, but is important for that one individual. And some of our um, early work motivating our treatment development started with ADHD. And we wanted to see by doing that, we actually were able to improve attention, improve cognitive control in patients with ADHD. And if we were able to do that, how were we doing this biologically? So these are data, and I'm just going to walk you quickly through it. So we stimulate patients on the left side or on the right side, or we did placebo. And on the left side, um, we have green as before stimulation and blue as after stimulation. And we saw that after one session, we were able to improve attention only for the left, not for the right, not for the placebo. And we saw that when we did that is because there was a specific part of the brain, signature of the brain, that's called the P300, that we were able to improve only for the left, not for the right, not with placebo, which led us to think that stimulating the left not only improve the cognitive functions of ADHD, but we have a biomarker that guide us how we plan treatment. We know that the specific P300, this physiological signature that is critical when we get patients better is because we move that dial. Um, so this got us started on a treatment study. Um, and we have actually a couple of treatment studies. This is a study we just published with Dr. Leffa, who's in our group. It was a study that was just published in JAMA Psychiatry. It's a, um, a journal in psychiatry that show that, yes, that TDCS done actually at home is better than placebo. It works clinically. We're doing more work in this space, but we're not only doing work for ADHD. We're also doing work for other conditions like ADHD that have executive deficits. For example, the cognitive deficits of long COVID, the mental focus of long COVID. We're seeing so many patients in neuropsychiatry with these deficits. It's unclear what it is. It's unclear how to treat them. We're starting to see that these approaches are good to treating the cognitive deficits of long COVID. And they're also good to treat the cognitive deficits of other psychiatric conditions and neurological conditions, just like Alzheimer's disease. So again, it's a new space of therapeutics. It's a new space of treatments. It can be done non-invasively. It's not painful. It can be done at home. And it's uniquely effective to improve cognitive disorders, ADHD, but not only ADHD. Things like long COVID, things like the cognitive of depression, of psychosis, and so on. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.